Before the Israelites left Babylon, the king of Persia, who had overthrown Babylon, decided to help them rebuild the temple back in Jerusalem. He organized people from all over the land to give livestock and supplies to the Israelites. He even returned all of the gold and silver that the Babylonians had stolen from the temple. 50,000 Israelites returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the altar of the temple, then laid the foundation for the building itself. Before the temple was even finished, the Israelites began to offer sacrifices and worship God in it once again. But other countries surrounding Jerusalem began to worry about the Israelites regaining power. So they sabotaged the rebuilding project, and it came to a standstill for 16 years. But God used two men, Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage the Israelites to resume building the temple and not to be afraid of their enemies. So they continued building, strengthened by the prophet's words. The opposition continued, this time from a man named Tatanai, the governor of a nearby region. He wanted to stop the Israelites from building and worked to convince the Persian king, Darius, to stop the Israelites. Not only did King Darius not stop the rebuilding project, he threatened Tatanai and anyone else who would try to stop the temple from being rebuilt, that he would kill them. Then he made Tatanai give funding, animals, and supplies to the Israelites. So the work continued, and almost 70 years after it had been destroyed, the Israelites finished rebuilding the temple. They dedicated it by sacrificing hundreds of animals to God and returning the priests back to their positions of leadership in the temple. God was once again worshipped in Jerusalem. As we continue the story, we're looking at chapter 19. And as the video had told us, this is a time period when after 70 years in exile in Babylon, that God's people, the people of the nation of Judah, are returning home. And this is a time of celebration. This is a time of excitement. It's a time that they're unified as they come home. But they cannot forget the fact that the reason why they were taken in captivity is because they were disobedient to God. They worshipped other gods. They had forgotten God as the center of their life. And so now God is returning them home because God is faithful. But the truth is, is that he's returning them home to be restored to God. And he's returning them home with a common mission. But what we need to understand is that when they left, when they were conquered by Babylon, and when they were taken into captivity, before they left, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and spoke hope to them. That even in the midst of their sin, even in the midst of their rebellion against God, God was faithful. And God promised that he would return them to Jerusalem, but also return them to him. If you'd like to turn your Bibles, we're going to look in Jeremiah 29. This is a very familiar passage, a passage of scripture that people look to, to be able to say, you know what? God has a purpose for my life. God has a plan for my life. And no matter how bad I mess up, no matter how much sin is in my life, God is greater and God is calling me back to him. But we need to understand the context. This was first spoken to the people who were getting ready to be taken into exile. And God, a faithful God, a God of the upper story, is speaking this to them through the prophet Jeremiah. We're going to look in verses 10 through 13 of Jeremiah 29. 10 through 13 of Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all of your heart. God promised this to them before they ever were taken to Babylon. This promise of I'm going to restore you back to me. Restore you back to relationship. And that's what we see in the beginning of time. All the way back in the garden. God has been faithfully, faithfully making a way for us to come back to him. Where sin has taken us away. 
where the enemy has come and stolen, God is faithful to make a way for us to come back. And that is what is promised here. So after 70 years in Babylon, what we see is God moves through a pagan king by the name of Cyrus, the Persian Empire. And Cyrus issues this decree. Cyrus issues the decree, you're going home. You're going home. We see this, if you want to turn to Ezra. We're going to be in here for for several verses. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And what's so amazing, again, this is a pagan king that God is using. They have been away from Jerusalem. They have been away from that relationship with God. And God is now moving. God is faithfully fulfilling his promise. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. So God is moving in this pagan king to say, not only send my people back, but God is also moving on him to give them all they need to rebuild the temple. Why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because their lives were to be centered around God. Their life was to be centered around the temple. And they had moved away from that, which is why they were even taken into exile to begin with. But now God is moving through this king to say, not only you're going home, but also I'm giving everything you need. And this was the decree in verses 3 through 4 by King Cyrus. It says, any one of his people among you, May his God be with you and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So what we see is 50,000 people are now going home. 50,000 people, and they're going home with King Cyrus, giving them the blessing, giving them a mission, and telling everybody, you better provide for him, because this temple must be built. And what's so neat about this is, again, there's an upper story going on at all times, and that's what God's doing, God's purpose, God's will. We see the lower story, which is our lives and what's going on. And for them, the lower story is they're going home, but the upper story is God was fulfilling his promise. Because who did God send to go with the people, to be the governor over the people? Zerubbabel. Why is that important? It's because he's in the line of David. Just like God promised from Judah in the line of David, the Messiah would come. And now we see who is going to go and lead the people there in Jerusalem, but from the line of David. And so King Cyrus is moved by God with this mission, build the temple. Zerubbabel is given a mission, build the temple. The people have one mission, build the temple. Restore God to his rightful place. That's God's heart from the beginning. That's the upper story for all of us. God wants us restored to him. And it's not by what we do, but it's by what God has done that we can be in relationship. But as I said, this was prophesied to the people before they left. You're going to be in Babylon for 70 years, and then you're going to come home. That was by Jeremiah. But there was another prophet in which God spoke through as well. And on the screen, you'll see selected verses from Isaiah 44, verses 24 through Isaiah 45, verse 13. And what I've selected here is passages of Scripture in which God is speaking through what is going to happen. Because again, God... God goes before us. God knows. And God is telling them what's going to happen. Let's look at these scriptures on the screen. This is spoke through Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. I am the Lord who says of Jerusalem. It shall be inhabited. The towns of Judah. They shall be built. And of their ruins I will restore them. Who says of Cyrus. He is my shepherd. And will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple. 
Let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor. Though you do not acknowledge me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you. Though you have not acknowledged me, this is what the Lord says concerning things to come. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. Now this sounds like Isaiah is writing this when they're getting ready to come home, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's spot on. But how many years do you think this was written before it actually happened? 160 years. And you cannot tell me that God is not in control. You cannot tell me that God's upper story will be fulfilled. 160 years. This is even before the Assyrians conquered Israel. This is before the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and before the Persians conquered the Babylonians. This is before those empires were risen to power. This is before Cyrus was even born. And God says, this is what's going to happen. And this is the guy that I'm going to use. That is the almighty God we serve. And if that doesn't blow you away, I don't know what does. Because God is in control. His upper story is unfolding. He will accomplish it. Praise God that he is on the throne. But as we see that they go home, they're sent home by Cyrus with Zerubbabel. But they're sent home with a common mission. That's the second thing I want to see in Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. That they are going home with a mission. 50,000 people. They're not going with different ideas. Someone's not over here wanting to open up a subway. Someone over here a bowling alley. No, they have one mission and it is to rebuild the temple. Restore God to his rightful place. And that's what we see in Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 and then in verses 10 and 11. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. Then Yeshua and his fellow priest in Zerubbabel began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priest in their vestments and with trumpets and cymbals took their places to praise the Lord. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. 50,000 people went back. And they had one clear mission. To make God's mission their mission. They weren't there to build houses. They weren't there to start businesses. They were not there to get some government resettlement program going in their family. No, they went for one mission. Restore God to his rightful place. That's what they went for. And the thing is, is when, we, when things are going good in our life, what usually happens? Challenges come, right? Tough times happen, trials, distractions. Well, that's what happened with them. Again, it said that they were as one man, 50,000 people, one mission, one purpose, were there for God. But then the distractions come. And all of a sudden, they were celebrating, but their neighbors weren't celebrating. Because their neighbors felt threatened all of a sudden. Oh no, now the people of Judah are going to come back and, and, and be built again. And so they went to distract them. They cut off their supply lines. They went to frustrate them. They eventually then threatened them. And they attacked them. All for the purpose to steal their mission. They did not want God's mission to be their mission. And you would think 50,000 people all united would stand up and go, no, we are staying strong. Well, that's not what happened. That's not what happened because they did get distracted. And there they are building and they're watching over their back because the enemy might attack them. And they got frustrated and they gave up. God had done all of this and had prophesied 160 years in advance. And here they are, challenges come and they just stop. And so what they start doing? They're like, well, this is, this is hopeless. Let's start building our own house. 
Let's start focusing on ourselves. And for 16 years, there was no work on God's temple. No work on God's presence being restored to the people. That's sad. It's sad that they lost that vision and lost it for so long. You know, this is what is called in the business world, mission creep. And it's not a person's name. It's not like you're a creep and you're stealing our mission. No, that's not what it is. This is mission creep. That means that you start to go to the side of what your mission is. You lose your mission. You creep away from what you were called to do, who you were called to be. For an example, that would be like Culver's. I love Culver's. Culver's is a great restaurant. And what is Culver's most well known for? Butterburger. Yes, Butterburger and their frozen custard, right? If you go there, and let's say they didn't have it anymore, it'd be like, what? What's the point? That's their mission. That's who they are. Butterburgers and frozen custard. Imagine if they lost focus, lost mission. And somebody had a great idea. Let's do butter burritos. I would not go get one. That does not sound good to me, butter burritos. But let's say they go butter burritos, and they're like, butter burgers, uh, that, let's, that's in the past. And today, it's butter burritos. And let's, let's not do custard, let's do corn. Let's just do corn. Imagine if they did that. What would happen to their mission? It would go to the side. People would go get a butter burger, and it would be like, like way at the bottom of their list. They'd put no focus to it, no time to it. They wouldn't be the same. That's called mission creep where you move away, you lose your vision, you get distracted, and your mission is gone. So how can we avoid that in our lives? How can Judah avoid that? Because the reality was, is that mission creep happened with them. They got distracted, they got moved to the side, and all of a sudden, God's mission was not their mission. Ezra 4.24, we see this. Ezra 4.24 says, Thus the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. God's mission was no longer their mission. It was no longer about God being restored. Actually, what we see is God had sent prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, and one one of those, Haggai, actually prophesied this in Haggai 1, 3 through 4. He spoke this truth to them, and, and he said, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, remains in ruin? They were building up their house. It got too challenging to do God's work. It's too hard to be faithful to God. So let's go ahead and build our house. Paneled house doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but it was a big deal to them. So they were building their own kingdom, their own home, their own temple, and allowing the presence of God to have no place to dwell with his people. They lost mission. They lost focus. Mission creep came in. So how? How do we avoid mission creep? How in our lives do we stay focused on God being first? For our young people that are graduating It is so important for you young people to make God first because there's so many things that are going to fight for your heart, fight for your time, fight for your attention. And if you are not fixed on God and everything you do to be filtered through God, it'll be so easy to just allow God to be a thing of yesterday. And many of us adults can testify to that because we've done the same thing. So how can we avoid this? How can we avoid this loss of mission, this mission creep, I'd like to look to Jesus for the answer. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're just going to look at two verses here. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But here what we see is Jesus, and he's speaking to the angel of the church of Ephesus. And Apostle John is recording this as what is revealed to him. And Jesus starts out by saying, you're doing some good things. You're doing some good things. But then he drops the hammer. Because good things don't matter unless it's God things. 
I'm going to say that again. Good things do not matter unless it's God things. Unless God is a part of it. You can be a good person all day long, but unless you have God, you are empty. You're empty. And Jesus is revealing to them, as he says in verse 4, Revelation chapter 2, he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. He's saying, you've lost your mission. God used to be first. Everything you did was God. God was your first love. Everything, your family, it was through God. Your work, it was through God. All the things you did was all about God, but you have let that go. And now you're doing things in the name of God, but there is no, no mission of God. It's not about God. And for us, so many times that happens, doesn't it? We get caught up in life. We get caught up in family. We get caught up in trials. There are so many distractions. And for us, it's easy just to slip away. For us, it's easy to slip away. And all of a sudden, we're not. Our mission is not based around God. Our life is not around God. God is a convenience. God is a convenience. And Jesus is saying, you have forsaken your first love. Now, for Center Christian Church, it could be easy to do the same. And we as a leadership always have to be holding each other accountable. And there's a lot of rabbit trails we can take. There's a lot of things that we can get focused on and distracted on. But we have to go back to this issue, this truth, this commandment, that we are to be about the work of Jesus Christ, the Great Commission. The Great Commission, that we are to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to go and teach them to obey all that Jesus has taught us. And we have, we have narrowed that down to four truths. And we'll see this. This is the mission of Center Christian Church. That we are to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But we're not supposed to stay there. We're supposed to grow in Christ. And as we grow in Christ, then Christ will be shown in our lives. We show Christ. And the last is this, that we go and make disciples. We go and make disciples. That is the mission that Christ has given his church. That is the mission at Center Christian Church. And we must stay focused to that. But that should be the mission of your life. That should be the mission of your family. That you're growing in Christ. And it's so easy to lose sight of that. But we need to go back to who we are. And so how do we avoid mission creep? Let's go to verse 5. And Jesus gives us the answer in this verse. Revelation 2 verse 5 says, Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. The first thing we can do to get back to that mission of God is my life. Everything I am, everything I do is God. We have to remember where we've fallen from. Remember that first love. Remember that relationship that drew you to God in the beginning. We need to remember that. We need to remember what that mission is in our life. To know, to grow, to show, and to go. We need to remember that from which we've fallen. That's the first thing. The second thing that we need to do is we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to cry out to God and ask forgiveness. God, I have not made you first in my life. I've been building my own kingdom and not yours. This area of my life, God, has not been given to you. So God, please forgive me and give me the strength to turn the other direction. Turn away from it and turn back to you. And the third thing that we see here, Jesus said, remember, repent, and then do the things you did at first. Go back. To that first love. Go back to the time when everything you did was all for him. Ask God to renew you, to refresh you, to make you new in vision, new in strength, new in passion, new in Christ. Some of us today need to do that. Some of you here today have you've fallen away. Other things have become your focus. And for our young people, it's so easy. It's so easy to start building another kingdom. It's so easy to make other things first. And we need to remember. We need to repent and allow God to renew us. That's what happened with Judah. God brought in two prophets. And the prophets spoke God's truth. And the people responded. And they remembered that mission. 
They remembered God in his rightful place. They remembered that they were to build the temple. And so they repented and they allowed God to renew their mission. And three and a half years after, the temple was built and God was restored to his people. Now Jesus summarizes this perfectly in Matthew 6, 33, and this is a powerful reminder for all of us. A powerful reminder for us in regards to our mission. What are we living for? What are we seeking? Jesus said this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. When Judah made God first, God added all their needs to him. But see, we get that backwards. We want to take care of our needs first, and then we'll focus on God. But that's not how it works. That is completely upside down. We need to seek God first. We need to know Christ, grow in Christ, show Christ, and make disciples for Christ. And then God will add all of our needs to us. We need that reminder. Young people today, that needs to be the focus of your heart. That needs to be the commitment of your life. So I ask today, where are you at? Where are you at in this process? If you were put in this picture of Judah, are you one that is committed to say, God, you're first in everything I have and everything I am I'm given to you? Are you on the other side and you've been building another kingdom? You've been building up your life and pushing God out. Where are you at? Are you knowing Christ? If you don't know Christ today, don't wait. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. But many of us here today, we know Christ, but we're not growing. And it's time for us to be able to repent and to be renewed and to start growing. And then if you're growing, you're showing Christ. And you're going and making disciples. That is who we are. The people of Judah, they were the children of God. And they built the kingdom of God. Today, we are his sons and daughters. And we are are co-heirs with Christ, and we must be about the work of his kingdom. Where are you today? We're going to have an invitation song. And as we do, I just ask that you stand and just, just pray and just say, God, do a good work in my life. Do a good work in my life. Because, God, you've got to be first. And the truth is, God is greater. He's greater than your trials. He's greater than your sin. He's greater than the gap between you and him. And God is the healer. God is the redeemer. Our God. Let's stand as we sing this song.